May this book serve the liberation of your true gifts so that countless multitudes of beings may benefit even more from your living and loving. Fear is lack of trust in now. Fear is saying no to someone, to some aspect of the present moment. The way of the superior man is the way of cultivating total trust in the reality that is living you right now. However vast it may be, reality is happening right now, and it includes you. Feel what is as it is, without resisting the boundless whole. Feeling all, saying yes to the entire now. You will know who you are. You will know yourself as the awake fullness of this entire moment, the very force of being. Identified with money or accomplishments, a man feels weak when he compares himself to others who have more. But when he knows himself to be self-radiant awareness, consciousness and lit up, awakening as a man, he blooms in perfect harmony with the immense energy of reality. The infinite force of now is his power and his presence. So the infinite force of now being total being totally aware of this present moment, essentially. Okay? Yep. The way of the superior man is to realize your true strength by knowing who you are at depth right now. You learn to feel into awareness fully, being fully aware. So you know yourself as conscious presence. You grow to trust the alive fullness of this moment, appearing spon spon uh, damn, spontaneously appearing sp <laughs> appearing spon what the fuck? How do you say that word? Spon spontaneously, spontaneously, spontaneously. See, it's kind of a hard word to say. Spontaneously appearing sp spontaneously. I'm gonna restart. You grow to trust the alive fullness of this moment appearing spontaneously as you and your experience. Your capacity to embody this profound force of presence in your gaze, your breath, and action determines your perceived value sexually and financially. Your woman and your world long for the authentic power of your awakened heart offered through your whole body. May your deepest gifts overflow in the way of the superior man. <laughs> Originally, I wrote the way of the superior man as a practical guide for men and their intimate lovers. I wanted to share with readers the lessons I had learned in life, specifically how a man can grow spiritually while passionately tussling with the challenges of women, work, and sexual desire. Now, years later, after sharing this work with thousands of men and women, straight and gay, single and coupled, I can confirm that the lessons presented in these chapters really produce results. And in today's world of rapid sexual and spiritual evolution and thus confusion, these lessons may be more relevant than ever. One of the more important lessons is this. As evolving human beings, we can learn that mastery is an important phase to accomplish and pass through in this school of life, where we are learning to love more artfully. Through the way described in this book, I have learned to love a woman into light, earn as much money as I want, doing what I love to do, and the master of arts of sexual loving. You can too. Okay, interesting. And then you will open to me, or sorry, and then you will open to your next lessons made possible by your real growth. Just as you have archived and outgrown all of your interest up until now. Remember what we were talking about earlier? Outgrowing your interest up until this moment, how you've outgrown stuff from childhood. Okay, so that's kind of what it's talking about right now. What you loved as a child is less interesting to you now as an adult. And what occupies your attention now will cease to sooner or later. This growth is both natural and good. We are designed to outgrow everything, including our desire to experience 
and improve the realms of money, sex, and intimacy. The way of the superior man shows you how a man and his lover can learn the lessons necessary to grow to the next step. Where the mind opens as feeling and the body is only light. There is a way to grow through these lessons too, I'm told, but first things first. Live completely. Know your deepest purpose. Give the gift you were born to give. Enjoy sex as a cosmic portal into love's wonders. Serve your friends so they may grow. And through the inevitable cycles of breathtaking success and gut-wrenching despair, when you have mastered and outgrown the challenges of women, work, and sexual desire, be willing to forget you were ever born. Eventually, and I'm telling you in advance, just like I was told, the way of the superior man renders obsolete everything that can be known or experienced. For now, start with what concerns you. I did. What my teachers in life required that I grow to understand the path that worked for me as a man in this world of infinite possibilities is offered in the chapters of this book. You will lay down your own path as you grow beyond your need to experience or know anything at all. So here's a summation for a new preface. Stop waiting, feel everything, love achingly, give impeccably, let go, repeat with whatever remains as long as you are moved to do so. This way dissolves wide open. <sighs> okay, catch my breath. Any questions, any thoughts? No, as of now, bruv. Huh? No, as of now. Do you have anything that you're wanting to take away from this? Any area of life that you currently may, may see yourself struggling, even if it's not yourself, maybe it's a way that other people can learn from a book of this nature, potentially? Um, for me, I feel like it's always been like, my recent trouble at least has always been like, how do I stay productive as possible and reach the I'm trying to attain, but then I end up not being as productive as I want to because of, you know, whatever reason that might be, you can't really create for yourself, but that's the main area that that makes me want to feel like, well, I'm not productive in this way, whether it's my mind or my body, because I simply am not putting the time to force it, you know, if they want to, they will type thing, you know? Right, right. Okay. But I don't know what, where I want to get back to take care of me first. <laughs> and then being able, and then, and that way I can take care of those around me. Yeah. I mean, you know, the old saying, fill your cup so you can fill other, yeah, fill your cup first so you can, you know, then fill other people's cup. I've like been filling everywhere else's cup. Yeah. And then yours is running dry. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see if this book has any pointers on that. Um, okay. Introduction. Are you ready? Very good. Ready? Introduction. This book is a guide for a specific kind of newly evolving man. This man is unabashedly masculine. He is purposeful, confident, and directed living his chosen way of life with deep integrity and humor. And he is sensitive, spontaneous, and spiritually alive, with a heart commitment to discovering and living his deepest truth. This kind of man is totally turned on by the feminine. He loves to take his woman sexually and ravish her, but not in some old style macho fashion. Rather, he wants to ravish her with so much love, she is vanished. They both vanish in the fullness of lovings itself. He is dedicated to incarnating love on this earth through his work and his sexuality. And he, and he does so as a free man, bound neither by counter convention nor inner cowardice. This newly evolving man is not a scared bully, posturing like some King Kong in charge of the universe, nor is he a new age wimp all spine, 
Oh, uh, sorry. All spineless, smiley, and starry-eyed. He has embraced both his inner masculine and feminine. And he no longer holds onto either of them. He doesn't need to be right all the time. Nor does he need to be always safe, cooperative, and sharing like an andro androgynous Mr. Nice Guy. He simply lives from his deepest core, fearlessly giving his gifts, feeling through the fleeting moment into the openness of existence, totally committed to magnifying love. To help, uh, sorry, to help illuminate the purpose of the way of the superior man, I will draw on a few principles of sexuality and spiritual growth, which are developed in my book, Intimate Communion. Until fairly recently, Modern roles for men and women were fixed and separated. Men were supposed to go out and earn money. Women were supposed to stay home and take care of the kids. Men often manipulated their women through physical and financial dominance and threat. Women often manipulated their men through emotional and sexual strokes and stabs. The typical and extreme caricatures of this previous time are the macho jerk and the submissive housewife. If you are reading this book, you have probably outgrown this first stage of sexual identity, or at least you can smile about it. Next came and is still coming a stage in which men and women both sought to balance their inner masculine and feminine energies toward 50-50 becoming more like one another. For instance, in the United States in the 1960s, men began to emphasize their inner feminine. They learned to go with the flow they let go of their rigid, one-dimensional masculine stance and embraced long hair, colorful, colorful clothes, nature, music, and a more carefree and sensual lifestyle. All means of embellishing or magnifying radiance, energy, and the abundant force of life, magnifying the feminine. Meanwhile, many women were doing just the opposite. They were magnifying their inner masculine, which at the level of human character appears as direction or clarity of purpose and vision. Women gain financial and political independence. They strengthen their careers, focus more on personal long-term goals, went to school in increasing numbers for advanced degrees and learn to be more assertive in their needs and desires. Chances are, if you are reading this book, you are more balanced than your parents were. If you are a woman, you are probably more independent and assertive than your, than your mother was. If you are a man, you are probably more emotionally expressive and open-minded than your father was. Or at least such qualities seem acceptable to you, even if you don't express them yourself. Remember, not that many years ago, a man who got his hair styled or a woman who, were, who wore a business suit was often considered suspect. It was a good thing as time progressed for men to embrace their inner feminine and women to embrace their inner masculine. They became less fragmented and more whole in the process. They became less dependent each, or sorry, they became less dependent on each other. Men could indeed change diapers and women were completely capable of emptying the mousetraps. Macho men became more loose and feeling. Submissive housewives became more independent and directed. In terms of social roles, men and women became more similar. This was an improvement for everyone, but this 50-50 stage is only a second and intermediate stage of growth for men and women, not an endpoint. Side effects of this trend towards sexual similarity can be seen as, major, as a major cause of today's unhappiness and intimacy. The trend toward 50-50 has resulted in economic and social equality, but also in sexual neutrality. Bank accounts are balancing while passions are fizzling out. Men are less macho while sex and violence continue to increase on TV and in the movies. Women are more in control of their economic destiny while they go in an increasing numbers to therapists and doctors to cope with stress-related dis-ease. Why is this happening? In my workshops and consultations, I hear independent and successful women complaining that many of today's men have become many of today's men have become wimps, too weak and ambiguous to really trust. Sensitive and affectionate men are complaining that many of today's women have become ball busters, 
too hardened and emotionally guarded to fully embrace. Is this the ultimate expression of human sexual wisdom and evolution, or is there another step to take? To answer these questions, we need to understand the nature of sexual passion and spiritual openness. Se sexual attraction is based on sexual polarity, which is the force of passion that arcs between masculine and feminine poles. All natural forces flow between two poles. The North and the South Poles of the Earth create a force of magnetism. This positive and negative poles of your electrical outlet or car battery create an electrical flow. In the same way, masculine and feminine poles between people create the flow of sexual feeling. This is sexual polarity. This force of attraction which flows between the two different poles of masculine and feminine is the dynamism that often disappears in modern relationships. If you want real passion, you need a ravisher and a ravishee. Otherwise, you just have two buddies who decide to rub genitals in bed. Each of us, man or woman, possesses both inner masculine and inner feminine qualities. Men can wear earrings, tenderly hug each other, and dance ecstatically in the woods. Women can change the oil in the car, accumulate political and financial power, and box in the ring. Men can take care of their children. Women can fight for their country. We have proven these things. Just about anyone can animate either masculine or feminine energy in any particular moment, although they still might have a strong preference to do one or the other, which we will get to in a moment. The bottom line of today's newly emerging 50-50 or second stage relationship is this. If men and women are clinging to a politically correct sameness, even in moments of intimacy, then sexual attraction disappears. I don't mean just the desire for intercourse, but the juice of the entire relationship begins to dry up. The love may still be strong, the friendship may still be strong, but the sexual polarity fades. Unless in moments of intimacy, one partner is willing to play the masculine pole and one partner is willing to play the feminine. You have to animate the masculine and feminine differences if you want to play in the, fold, in the field of sexual passion. This is true in homosexual as well as heterosexual relationships. Actually, the gay and lesbian community is acutely aware that sexual polarity is independent of gender. But you still need two poles for a passionate play of sexually or sorry of sexuality to persist to persist in a relationship masculine and feminine top and bottom butch and theme whatever you want to call these reciprocal poles of sexual play it is up to you you can have a loving friendship between two similars but you need a more masculine and a more feminine partner in the moments when you want to when you want strong sexual polarity it doesn't matter if both partners are men or both are women. It doesn't matter if in a heterosexual relationship, the man plays the feminine pole and the woman plays the masculine pole. It doesn't matter if you change every day who plays the masculine pole and who plays the feminine pole. For sexual polarity, you need an energetic polarity, an attractive difference between masculine and feminine. You don't need this difference for love, but you do need it for ongoing sexual passion. For some people who have what I call a more balanced sexual essence, sexual polarity doesn't really matter. They don't really want much passion in intimacy. They don't want a loving tussle full of sexual inspiration and, and innuendo. They would rather have a civilized friendship full of love and human sharing without the passionate ups and downs. And for these people, this book will be irrelevant, possibly even offensive. This book is written specifically for people who have a more masculine sexual essence and their lovers who will have a more feminine sexual essence. Since you always attract your, sex your sexual reciprocal, these people can't help but be attracted into relationships based on difference, for better or for worse. Your sexual essence is your sexual core. If you have a more masculine sexual essence you would of course enjoy staying home and playing with the kids but deep down you are driven by a sense of mission 
You may not know your, your mission, but unless you discover this deep purpose and live it fully, your life will feel empty at its core. Even if your intimate relationship and family live, or sorry, even if your intimate relationship and family life are full of love. If you have a more feminine and sexual essence, your professional life may be incredibly successful, but your core won't be fulfilled unless love is flowing fully in your family or intimate life. The quote unquote mission or the search for freedom is the priority of the masculine. Financial freedom. Huh? The mission or the search for freedom is the priority of the masculine. Whereas the search for love is the priority of the feminine. This is why people with masculine essences would rather watch a football game or a boxing match on TV than a love story. Sports are all about achieving freedom, such as by breaking free of your opponent's tackle or barrage of punches and about succeeding at your mission by carrying the ball into the end zone or remaining standing after 10, 10 rounds. For the masculine mission, competition, and putting it all on the line, indeed facing death, are all forms of ecstasy. Witness the masculine popularity of war stories, dangerous heroisms, and sports playoffs. But for the feminine, the search for love touches the core. Whether on soap operas and love stories, or talking with friends about relationships, the desire for love is what appears in feminine forms of entertainment. The feminine wants to be filled with love, and if the bliss of real love is not forthcoming, chocolate and ice cream or a good romantic drama will do. The masculine wants to feel, feel the bliss of a life lived at the edge, and if he doesn't have the balls to do it himself, he'll watch it on TV, in sporting events, and cop shows. It even sorry gotta catch my breath I hear you bro <laughs> even happy and fulfilled men and women find it enjoyable to watch sports and eat ice cream of course I am just trying to make a point even though all people have both masculine and feminine qualities that they could use in any moment to kick corporate ass or to nurture children for instance most men and women have a more masculine or feminine core and this shows up in their regularly chosen entertainments as much as in their preferred sexual play. Think about it. Would you rather that your sexual partner was physically stronger than you? Or would you prefer to feel your lover's physical vulnerability? Which would turn you on more? To pin your partner on the bed below you or to be pinned below your partner? To be swept off your feet by a sensitive and strong lover or to feel your lover surrender? swooning in your arms you may want both at different times but most often which turns you on more or does each of these alternative alternatives turn you on just the same that is are you just as turned on by a sexual partner who is physically weaker than you as by one who is stronger or exactly the same strength most people about 90 percent in my experience seem to have a definite preference they definitely either prefer that their partner kills the cockroach crawling toward them or they're fine with doing the crunchy job themselves, perhaps with sporting fervor. Most people clearly favor watching a romantic love story on TV to a bloody boxing match or vice versa. They might be able to enjoy both at times, but but their core becomes more emotionally involved in one or the other. If you ever seen a group of masculine people watching a Super Bowl game, you kn you know just how emotional the masculine core becomes while beholding a good mission of people living at the edge and giving their gifts or getting slaughtered for failing. So about 90% of people have either a more masculine or a more feminine sexual essence, passionately, lovingly, and fiercely. They would like to be ravished by or to ravish their intimate partner at least by some of the time in addition to having a loving friendship. This holds true for homosexual and heterosexual people alike. About 10% of people, men and women, heterosexual and homosexual have a more balanced essence. Boxing matches and love stories equally make them 
emotional or not, it doesn't really matter to them. Whether their lover is physically stronger or more vulnerable than them. Sexual polarity just isn't that important to them in a relationship anyway. Regardless of gender or sexual orientation, if you want to experience deep spiritual or sexual fulfillment, you must know your natural sexual essence, masculine, feminine, or balanced, and live true to it. That's key. Regardless of gender or sexual orientation, if you want to experience deep spiritual and sexual fulfillment, you must know your natural sexual essence, masculine, feminine, or balanced, and live true to it. And that doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're a guy with feminine energy or a girl with masculine energy. Whichever energy you naturally have within you, you have to just live true to that energy to be fulfilled spiritually and sexually, I guess. Anyways, you can't deny your true sexual essence by covering it with layers of false energy for years and then expect to know your authentic purpose and be free in the flow of love. This book is a guide to shedding pretense and living true to your core, specifically for people who have a masculine sexual essence and their feminine essence lovers who have to deal with them. In a well-intentioned effort to provide equal opportunity and rights for men and women, many people are inadvertently squashing their true sexual essence. They don't have to. It's certainly possible to provide equality while also living true to your masculine or feminine core. But most people don't, so they suffer. Most people are forgetting that the sameness that works in the office does not work in intimacy for about 90% of couples. Those couples composed of partners with masculine and feminine essences rather than balanced essences. If sexual passion is to flow in these polarized intimacies, masculine and feminine differences should be magnified, not diminished, in moments of intimacy. When these polarities are lessened due to family or work obligations, sexual attraction is diminished along with spiritual depth and physical health. Stressing your masculine or feminine essence, sorry, stressing your masculine or feminine essence into a falsely balanced persona affects virtually every part of you. Many people with true feminine or feminine essences manifest a whole range of disturbed um, physio physiological symptoms as their feminine energy dries up due to running excess masculine energy through their body year after year in order to fit into the masculine style of work. Okay. I can see that. You say that again? Um, stressing your masculine or feminine essence into a falsely balanced persona affects virtually every part of you. Many people with true feminine essences manifest a whole range of disturbed physiological symptoms as their feminine energy dries up due to running excess masculine energy through their body year after year in order to fit into their masculine style of work so say a woman is like a ceo or or you know business owner or whatever doing more masculine duties like their main focus is to make money or to run a business versus like nurturing their kids or doing more like caretaking natural feminine energy type stuff and they natch and that woman naturally has a feminine core then because they're running so much masculine energy through their body through their actions and what they do it kind of like basically just dries their energy up from what i'm understanding gotcha um <sighs> Um, year after year in order to fit into the masculine style of work and many people with masculine essences Seeking to fit in with the feminine style of cooperation and energy flow disconnect from their sense of life purpose and Inhibit their deep truth Afraid of the consequences of being authentic to their own masculine core Hence the frequent complaints about too many ball busters and wimps It's a condition Furthermore, when you deny your true core, you deny the possibility of true and real love. Love is openness, 
through and through. And true spirituality is the practice of love and the practice of openness. A person who denies their own essence and hides their true desires is divided and unable to relax into the full openness of love. Their spirit becomes cramped and kinked, unable to feel the natural ease and unconstrained power of their own core. They feel threatened and frightened. This fear is the texture of their inability to open fully in love. Such a person is spiritually handicapped, obstructed at heart, even though they may have achieved a safe relationship and a successful career. So as a culture, we have advanced in terms of personal freedom, sexual equality, and social rights, but we have remained spiritually thwarted and afraid for the sake of individual autonomy and social fairness. With only good intentions in mind, we have erroneously began to deny smooth, um, smooth out and neutralize our masculine and feminine differences. In doing so, people often end up denying their deepest core desires, which are rooted in their true sexual essence. A lot of people today think they have a balanced sexual essence, but in most cases, they are actually suppressing the natural desires, which spring from their real masculine or feminine core. It is important to admit what is real if you are going to really deal with your life. The way of the superior man focus, focuses, sorry, focuses on many of these issues which we often sidestep or deny. For example, if you truly have a balanced sexual essence, then you are just not that sexually distracted by anyone. But if you are, for instance, a heterosexual man with a true masculine sexual essence, then you will be more or less constantly sexually attracted to feminine women you see all day at the workplace and on the street, to married women as well as teenage girls. As long as they shine the feminine light, you will feel the pool. How do you turn this potential sexual problem into a spiritual gift? If you have a masculine sexual essence, then you should probably admit if you, are, if you were being brutally honest that your intimate relationship is just not as important to you as the mission in your life, but you still want a full and energetic intimate relationship, perhaps quite as badly. How do you deal with this often misunderstood dilemma? That's the... Right? Yeah. You like that? That's us. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's it's it is hard to balance. Like you want to make sure that you are constantly driving, like you have a constant driving purpose. You're constantly trying to figure out what it is. But being in a relationship also takes. Mm -hmm. But you want both. But you want both. Yeah. Like how do I? put my all into my relationship and into my work or finding my purpose or helping myself, you know, self-help or whatever, self-development. Right. How do I do it all while still you know, balancing out where something is not losing something where, you know, where something else is gaining? Yeah. Damn. Okay. <laughs> That's what this book is supposedly supposed to set the record straight on. Okay. Well, continue on, my friend. Okay. To answer questions such as these as clearly as possible, I have chosen to write this book as if speaking to the most common case of masculine sexual essence. A heterosexual man with a masculine sexual essence. As I've said, there are many other possible arrangements of gender, essence, and sexual preference. You could, for instance, be a heterosexual woman with a masculine essence married to a man with a feminine essence, or a homosexual man with a masculine essence married to a man with a feminine essence, and the principles in this book would still apply to, would still apply to you, but I trust the reader to make the appropriate adjustments in wondering, sorry, in wording for his or her own unique case if it is different from this most common one. I suppose the book could have been called The Way of the Superior Person with a Masculine Essence, but the whole thing would become unwieldy if I tried to unfold every possible 
permutation of he and she and masculine as sexual essence and balanced sexual es essence and feminine sexual essence in every possible heterosexual, bisexual, and homosexual relationship. In the end, I opted for simplicity. You can add the permutations yourself. If you or your partner has a masculine sexual essence, regardless of autonomy, gender, or sexual preference, this book will help you clarify your life and enable you to give your deepest gifts personally and at work, sexually and spiritually. The Way of the Superior Man is a book written explicitly for people who have already achieved respect for other genders and sexual preferences and who consider men and women to be social, economic, and political equals. Now we are ready to move to the next stage, grounded in this mutual respect and equality, but celebrating the sexual and spiritual passions inherent in the masculine-feminine polarity. It is time to evolve beyond the macho jerk ideal, all spine and no heart. It is also time to evolve beyond the sensitive and caring total wimp ideal, all heart and no spine. Heart and spine must be united in a single man and then gone beyond in the fullest expression of love and consciousness possible, which requires a deep relaxation into the infinite openness of this present moment. And this takes a new kind of guts. This is the way of the superior man. That's the opening. Oh, right this right there, right? Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Did it did it kind of lay good groundwork for what this is, book is supposed to be about? Sure. For sure. You got any questions? Anything that peaked? I'm excited to hear what he has to say, to be honest. You want me to continue? All right, part one, title The Man's Way. Okay, part one. Stop hoping for a completion of anything in life. Most men, oh, <laughs> yeah, I read this one earlier. Stop hoping for a completion of anything in life. Most men make the error of thinking that one day it will be done. They think, if I can work enough, then one day I could rest. Or one day my woman will understand something and then she will stop complaining. Or I'm only doing this now so that one day I can do what I really want with my life. The masculine error is to think that eventually things will be different in some fundamental way. They, they won't. It never ends. As long as life continues, the creative challenge is to tussle, play, and make love with the present moment while giving your unique gift. It's never going to be over, so stop waiting for the good stuff. As of now, spend a minimum of one hour a day doing whatever you are waiting to do until your finances are more secure or until the children have grown and left home or until you have finished your obligations and you feel free to do what you really want to do. Don't wait any longer. Don't believe in the myth of one day when everything, one day when everything will be different. Do what you love to do, what you are waiting to do, what you were, what you've been born to do now. Spend at least one hour a day doing whatever you simply love to do, what you deeply feel you need to do in your heart in spite of the daily duties that seem to constrain you. However, be forewarned, you may discover that you don't or can't do it. That in fact, your fantasy of your future life is simply a fantasy. Most postponements are excuses for a lack of creative discipline. Limited money and family obligations have never stopped a man who really wanted to do something. Although they provide excuses for a man who is not really up to the creative challenge in the first place. Find out today whether you are willing to do what it takes to give your gift fully. As a first step, spend at least one, spend at least an hour today giving your fullest gift, whatever that is for today, so that when you go to sleep at night, you know you couldn't have lived your day with more courage, creativity, and giving. In addition to the myth that one day your life will be fundamentally different, you may believe in and hope that one day your woman will be fundamentally different. Hold on, I'm gonna pause real quick. 
Alright, to restart my campfire sounds. So I had to restart my campfire sounds. Oh. <laughs> it's helping me like read a little better. It's like kind of breaking up the silence in my head in the uh, mic. Okay. okay. <clears throat> in addition to the myth that one day your life will be fundamentally different, you may also believe and hope that one day your woman will be fundamentally different. Don't wait. Assume she's going to be however she is forever. If your woman's behavior or mood is truly intolerable to you, you should leave her and don't look back since you cannot change her. However, if you find her behavior or mood is merely distasteful or a hassle, realize that she will always seem this way. The feminine always seems chaotic and complicated from the perspective of the masculine. The next time you notice yourself trying to fix your woman so that she will no longer fill in the blank, relax and give her love by touching her and telling her that you love her when she is this way, whatever you filled in the blank with. Embrace her or wrestle with her or scream and yell for the heck of it, but make no effort to bring an end to that which pisses you off. Practice love instead of trying to bring an end to the quality that bothers you. You can't escape the tussle with the feminine. Learn to find humor in the, in the unending emotional drama the feminine seems to enjoy so much. The love that you magnify may realign her behavior, but your effort to fix her and your frustration never will. The world and your woman will always present you with an unforeseen challenge or unforeseen challenges. You are either living fully, giving your gift in the midst of those challenges even today, or you are waiting for an imaginary future which will never come. Men who have lived significant lives with men, or sorry, <laughs> men who have lived significant lives are men who, who never waited, not for money, not for security, ease, or women. Feel what you want to give most as a gift to your woman and to the world and do what you can to, to give it today. Every moment waited is a moment wasted and each wasted moment degrades your clarity of purpose. Mind blown. I'm going to reread that last sentence. Feel what you want to give most as a gift to your woman and to the world and do what you can to give it today. Every moment waited is a moment wasted and each wasted moment degrades your clarity of purpose. So that. Right? So that. Dang. Chapter two. Want me to continue? Yes, sir. Chapter two. Live with an open heart, even if it hurts. Closing down in the midst of pain is a denial of a man's true nature. A superior man is free in feeling and action, even amidst great pain and hurt. If unnecessary, a man should live with a hurting heart rather than a closed one. He should learn to stay in the wound of pain and act with spontaneous skill and love, even from that place. Repeat that last sentence. He should learn to stay in the wound of pain and act with spontaneous skill and love, even from that place. So as a man, you're going to endure pain. So even through feeling pain, that's okay. But even while you're feeling pain, you're still acting with love and spontaneous skill. So you're still trying to master and master life skillfully, even through certain pains that you may have to endure. Imagine failing at a major project, lying to your woman and getting caught or overhearing her joke about your shortcomings in bed. 
How do you react with your body, breath, and eyes? Notice if you react to a person or situation that hurts you by withdrawing, hiding, or closing in on yourself. Tight. Hmm. Notice if there are times when you find it difficult to look into someone's eyes, or times your chest and solar plexus become tense and contracted. These are signs of an unskillful reaction to hurt. Contracted and closed in on yourself, you are unable to act. You are trapped in your own self-protective tension, no longer a free man. The superior man practices opening during these times of automatic closure. Ooh. As a man, you gotta be open whenever you feel like you need to close. I'm gonna read that one more time. The superior man practices opening during these times of automatic closure. Open the front of your body so your chest and solar plexus are non-tense. Sit or stand up straight and full, opening the front of your body, softening your chest and belly wide and free. Breathe down through your chest and solar plexus, deep into your belly. Look directly into, your, into the eyes of whoever you are with, feeling your own pain, as well as feeling the other person. Only when the front of your body is relaxed and opened, your breath will full. You breathe. Oh, sorry. Only when the front of your body is relaxed and opened, your breath full and deep, and your gaze unguarded and directly connected with another person's eyes, can your fullest intelligence manifest spontaneously in the situation. Mm. Okay. To act as a, as a superior man. A samurai of a relationship, you must feel the entire situation with your whole body. A closed body is unable to sense subtle, subtle cues and signals and therefore un, uh, unable to act with mastery in the situation. How do you feel about that chapter? Uh, I don't do you understand? Have you, ever, have you ever been caught in a situation where you feel like you're not able to, um, like, I guess you're kind of overthinking the situation. Like you naturally are more subdued. Um, I feel like whatever I'm in like any uh, situation like that, I try to my best to remain open. And the times where I do close up are times where I don't feel like me opening up is helping anything. Like me being open is helping anything. So that goes up. So I have like a threshold. Okay. I got you. Seven. Okay. Chapter three. And let me know too if you have to go. We'll wrap up part one if you have to go. No, I don't have that for us today. Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay. Chapter three. Live as if your father were dead. A, a man must love his father and yet be free of his father's expectations and criticisms in order to be a free man. Imagine that your father has died or remember when he did die. Are there any feelings of relief associated with his death? Now that he is dead, is any part of you happy that you need to not live up to his expectations or suffer his criticisms? How would you have lived your life differently if you had never tried to please your father? If you never tried to show your father that you were worthy? If you never felt burdened by your father's critical eye? For the next three days, do at least one activity a day that you have avoided or suppressed because of the influence of your father. In this way, practice being free of his subtle expectations, which may now reside within your own self-judgment. Practice being free in this way once each once each day for three days, even if you feel even if you still feel fearful, limited, unworthy, or burdened by your father's expectations. That was a short chapter. Part four. Huh? So yeah, it was early out. 
anything to really relate to that chapter. Me neither. Me neither. I, I don't really have that problem of um, my dad. You know, I feel like that wouldn't apply to me either. Yeah, it's like anything I, I've ever done is not for my father's sake. That means you probably, ha you know, me and you both have healthy relationships with our with our father figures. Yeah. So, sounds more of like an unhealthy father son relationship. Right. Right. Okay. Part four. Know your real edge, and don't fake it. It is honorable for a man to admit his fears, resistance, and edge of practice. It is simply true that each man has his limit his capacity for growth and his destiny. But is but it is dishonorable for him to lie to himself or others about his real place. He shouldn't pretend he is more enlightened than he is, nor should he stop short of his actual edge. The more a man is playing his real edge, the more valuable he is as a good company for other men, the more he can be trusted to be authentic and fully present. Where a man's edge is located is less important than whether he is actually living his edge in truth rather than being lazy or deluded. That means don't front. That means if if you are a person that maybe is not disciplined, don't talk about being disciplined. Yeah. Pick an area of your life, perhaps your intimate relationship, your career, your relationship with your children or your spiritual practice. For instance, you are currently doing something to earn a living. Where do your fears stop you from making a larger contribution to mankind, from earning a higher income or from earning money in a more creative and enjoyable way? If you were absolutely fearless, would you be earning a living in exactly the same way as you are now? If you were absolutely fearless, would you be earning a living in a different way than you are now? Absolutely. Your edge is where you stop short or where you compromise your fullest gift and instead cater to your fears. Have you lost touch with the fears that are limiting and shaping your income and style of livelihood? If you have deluded yourself and feel that you are not afraid, then you are lying to yourself. All men are afraid unless they are perfectly free. If you cannot admit this, you are pretending to yourself and to others. Your friends will feel your fear, even if you do not. Thus, they will lose trust in you, knowing you are deluding yourself, lying to yourself, and are therefore likely to lie to them consciously or unconsciously. Or perhaps you are very aware of your fears. Your fear is to take risks, your fear of failing, or your fear of succeeding. Perhaps you are comfortable with your life and you fear the lifestyle change that might accompany a change in career, even though the new career will be closer to what you really want to do with your life. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a really good one. Some men fear the feeling of fear and therefore don't even approach their edge. They choose a job they know they can do well and easily and don't even approach the fullest giving of their gift. Their lives are relatively secure and comfortable, but dead. They lack the aliveness, the depth, the inspirational energy. That is the sign of a man living at his edge. If you are this kind of man who is hanging back, working hard perhaps, but not at your real edge, other men will not be able to trust that you can and will help them live at their edge and give their fullest gift. Mm. As an experiment, describe your edge with respect to your career out loud to yourself. Say something like, I know I could be earning more money, but I am too lazy to put in the extra hours it would take. I know that I could give more of my true gift, but I am afraid that I may not succeed, and then I will be a penniless failure. I've spent 15 years developing my career, and I'm afraid to let go of it 
and start fresh, even though I know that I spend most of my life doing things I have no real interest in doing. I could be making money in more creative ways, but I spend too much time watching TV rather than being creative. Honor your edge, honor your choices. Be honest with yourself about them. Be honest with your friends about them. A fearful man who knows he is fearful is far more trustable than a fearful man who isn't aware of his fear. And a fearful man who still leans into the, his fear, living at his edge and putting his gift out from there. Sorry, I'm gonna restart that sentence. I butchered it. And a fearful man who still leans into his fear, living at his edge and putting his gift out from his gift out from there is more trustworthy and more inspirational than a fearful man who hangs back in the comfort zone, unwilling to, ex to even experience his fear on a day to day level. A free man is free to acknowledge his fears without hiding them or hiding from them. Live with your hips, your lips pressed against your fears, kissing your fears, neither pulling back nor aggressively violating them. Any thoughts? <laughs> Does that resonate with you at all? Um, I'm trying to relate to and see where my edge is and at the same thing. I would say that mine would be that I could be making more money if instead of playing as much Xbox as I do now, maybe I'll stream. Um, if I do play as much Xbox as I do now, maybe play, try to make money in a more creative way by like streaming or putting in the time that I do play Xbox into honing my skills at coding or even like creating an app that could possibly make me more money. So that's kind of what I was thinking about during that time. It's like. So basically, your edge, your edge is losing the comfort of kind of like that escape that you have whenever you play Xbox. Yeah, it's not. It's not that I don't feel like I should be playing. It's more like if you're gonna play, either limit yourself for as much as you play because it's a waste of time if you're not making money doing it, or make money doing it. Right. Or attempt to make money doing it at least. Cause I've never attempted to start streaming or anything like that. When I definitely probably should like, like but I'd be good on stream, but maybe I'll try. Okay. Yeah. That's a good edge. That's a good recognition and self reflection. I feel like for myself <laughs> I feel like for myself it is my edge is my edge dance a good question when you whenever you try to answer it i would say my edge is escaping the comfortable routine and kind of being um more willing to venture into the unknown because you start you have to literally for me I had to start doing things differently and experience different things I haven't experienced to be able to master certain things whether it be you know being um, investing in anything you know like m right. developing more money um, competencies so whether it be like real estate transactions um, investing my money uh, credit worthy like just different things like that and being able to develop those things um also putting the time and energy into um, my own personal development so like speaking more clearly improving my enunciation of different words in my vocabulary so i can be a more uh a more confident person whenever i'm speaking because i have a you know a wide range of knowledge and vocabulary because you do things that aren't comfortable like reading you know if you aren't used to reading maybe if you're used to reading and that's what you're good at which was that's what you're used to it's not as uncomfortable for, but for me it's like 
you know, I, I need to become better at it. I need to put a, put away different things like TV or like easy social media consumption or watching basketball games, you know. So that's kind of my edge. It's like, it's like putting more into my own personal self-development. Even, even when I don't necessarily want to, but making myself want to do that. That would, that would be living at my edge. Okay. Okay. Pushing my edge forward anyways. Okay. Chapter five. Always hold to your deepest realizations. Eternity must be a man's home. Moment by moment. Without it, he is lost. Always striving, grasping at puffs of smoke. A man must do anything necessary to glimpse and then stabilize this ever fresh realization and organize his life around it. So whatever your purpose is, you must organize your life around it. Make your life an ongoing process of being who you are at your deepest and most easeful levels of being. So whoever Kelvon is at his being, whoever D is at his being. Make your life an ongoing process of being who you are at your deepest, most easeful levels of being. Everything other than this process is secondary. Your job, your children, your wife, your money, your artistic creations, your pleasures, they all are superficial and empty. If they are not floating in the deep sea of your conscious loving. How many hours today was your attention focused in the realm of changes? on events, people, thoughts, and experiences, and how often was your attention relaxed into its source? Where is your attention right now? Can you feel its source? Even for a moment, can you feel that which makes attention conscious and aware? Can you feel the deepest nature of attention? What happens when you simply effortlessly allow attention to subside into its source? This source is never changing and always present. It is the constant silent tone behind the pervading, behind pervading the music of life. Feel into this source as deeply as possible and then reapproach your work, intimacy, family, and creative efforts. When you make money, make money from this source. Find out what happens to the details of your life when you live more consistently from this source. So that's basically saying just being present in your own mind, in your own consciousness and being that being present into who Kelvon is. Operate from that point, whoever the are the other member of our book reading crew is. Be true to that. I got to be true to me. Who is who am I at my core? What are my values? Right. I'm thinking from that moment, who do I want to be? Who do I want to be perce like perceived as? Because I'm, I'm basically putting out what I am at my core. Right. You know. Who is? Okay, at least come on. What do I want to achieve? Who? Who? What does my core want to achieve? I would say for you and for me both, we both want to be the best versions of ourselves. So, so always operate from that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of what it's saying. Always operate from that place. Don't operate from the place of fear. Don't operate from the place of some other person's opinion of you. And that that being what motivates you. Hey. Hey. Use aids to support your relaxation into and creation from this source. Read books that remind you of who you are in truth. Spend time with people who inspire and reflect the source to you. Meditate, contemplate, or pray daily so that you steep yourself into the source. It literally says the same thing in the War of Art. If you are like most men, you have strong habits that rivet your attention to, to the events and tasks of the day. Days and nights fly by over the years and life slips through your fingers, your attention absorbed in the seeming world of necessary responsibilities. Hmm. But all of its 
but all of it is empty if we do not live our responsibilities as expressions of our depth of being and our heart truth. No, no, it's not like N-O, but K-N-O-W. No eternity. Do whatever it takes. And from the depth and from this depth of being, live the details of your life. But if you postpone the process of submerging yourself in the source for the sake of taking care of business first, your life will be spent in hours and days of business and then it will be gone. Only if you are well grounded in what in that which is larger than life, you will be able to play life with humor, knowing that each task is a mirage of necessity. Even if you find yourself in some trivial moment watching TV or cleaning up a mess in the kitchen, feel the truth of who you are. Feel the boundless cognizance in which each instant seems and vanishes. All moments are the same intensity of clarity, completeness, and humor when you meet each moment with your deepest realization. Nothing that has ever happened has made any difference to the one who you are. Do you understand that? Basically saying live every moment in the moment right like live. even even doing trivial tasks do it from a place of like i am why you're doing it why you're doing that trivial task and then what you and then it's gonna cause you to do it in a manner of how you want to carry yourself even if you're like wiping up uh uh wiping up a mess on the kitchen floor you're going to do it half ass or you're going to do it to a way of like, say you're watching the best version of yourself do it. Like, no, I'm going to clean it up. Like rightfully so. I'm going to throw this in the trash. I'm not going to do it in a lazy manner. I'm going to like place it in the garbage can like a man. With meaning. With meaning. Yes, exactly. Good, 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 good. Yes. Okay. Chapter six. Never change your mind just to please a woman. If a woman suggests something that changes a man's perspective, then he should make a new decision based on his new perspective. But he should never betray his own deepest knowledge and intuition in order to please his woman or go along with her. Both she and he will be weakened by such an action. They will grow to resent each other and the crust of accumulated in inauthenticity will burden their love as well as their capacity for free action. You should always listen to your woman and then make your own decision. If you choose to go with your woman's suggestion, even when you when deep in your heart, you feel that another decision is more wise. You are in effect saying, I don't trust my own wisdom. You are weakening yourself by telling yourself this. You are weakening your woman's trust in you. Why should she trust your wisdom if you don't? Damn. When you deny your deep truth to please your woman, everyone will feel your lack of authenticity. They will sense that your false smile hides an inner di division. Your friends, children, and business colleagues may love you, but they won't trust you since you don't trust your own core intent. And more importantly, your own sense of inauthenticity will burden your capacity to act with clarity. Your actions won't jibe with your core. Mm. Damn, damn, damn. However, if you listen to your woman, taking everything she says into account and making your own best decision, then you are acting in accordance with your core. You are saying, in effect, my deepest wisdom is leading me to this decision. If I am wrong, I will learn from it. And my wisdom will have deepened. I'm willing to be wrong and grow from it. I trust this process of acting from my deepest wisdom. This attitude of self-trust engenders others trust in you you may be wrong but you are willing to find out and thus grow from the experience you are open to listening to others but in the end you will take the responsibility of making your own decision there is nobody else to blame however if you give up your real decision to follow your woman's 
then you will blame her for being wrong if she is wrong and you will feel disempowered if she is right having denied yourself the opportunity to act from your core and grow from your mistakes be open to changing your feeling based on whatever your woman might reveal to you through her words or her body language then make your own decision based on your deepest intuitive wisdom and knowledge you may make the right decision or the wrong one but whatever happens it is your best shot and you will strengthen your capacity for future action trust in yourself basically i feel like trust in what you believe in is your own and from it yeah but it basically like even it's not saying don't listen to your significant other Right. It's just saying, take what they say, internalize it, and make a decision from your own core if it is your place to make a decision. Yeah. And if what she says resonates with you and it's not making you change your decision, then you don't have to necessarily change your decision because your girl has a, the same decision as you. Right. You know what I'm saying? Chapter seven. Your purpose must come before your relationship. Ooh, this is interesting. Every man knows that his highest purpose in life cannot be reduced to any particular relationship. If a man prioritizes his relationship over his highest purpose, he weakens himself, deserves, disserves, not deserves, disserves the universe and cheats his woman of an authentic man who can offer her full undivided presence admit to yourself that if you had to choose one or the other the perfect intimate relationship or achieving your highest purpose in life you would choose to succeed at your purpose just this self-knowledge often relieves much pressure a man feels to, to prioritize his relationship when in fact it is not his highest priorities. Ooh wee, that burns. That burns. Admit to yourself that if you had to choose one or the other, the perfect intimate relationship or achieving your highest purpose in life, you would choose to succeed at your purpose. Just this self-knowledge often relieves much pressure a man feels to prioritize his relationship when in fact it is not his highest priority. Damn. Your mission is your priority. I've been there before. Thanks. <laughs> your mission is your priority. Unless you know your mission and have aligned your life to it, your core will feel empty. Your presence in the world will be weakened as will your presence with your intimate partner. The next time you notice yourself giving in to your woman, postponing your mission and denying your true purpose in order to spend time with her, stop. Tell your woman that you love her, but you cannot deny your heart's purpose. Tell her that you will spend 30 minutes or some specific time with her in absolute attention and total presence, but then you must return to carry on your mission. Your woman will be more fulfilled with 30 minutes of a 30 minutes a day of undivided attention and ravishing love than she will with a few hours of your week and divided presence when your heart really isn't into it. Time you spend with your woman should be time you really want to be with her more than anything else. If you'd rather be doing something else, she'll feel it. Both of you will be dissatisfied. Lose, lose, lose situation. Yep. Chapter 8. Lean just beyond your edge. In any given moment, a man's growth is optimized if he leans just beyond his edge, his capacity, his fear. He should not be too lazy, happily stagnating in the zone of security and comfort nor should he push far beyond his edge, stressing himself unnecessarily, unable to metabolize his experience. 
He should lean just slightly beyond the edge of fear and discomfort constantly in everything he does. Okay. So don't overdo it. Right. Don't go too far out of your comfort zone right now. But also don't hang back. Just live right, right beyond your edge. Once you are honest with yourself about your real edge, it is best to lean just beyond it. Very few men have the guts for this practice. Most men either settle for the easy path of self ag aggrandize themselves. Oh, sorry. Most men either settle for the easy path or self aggrandize themselves by taking the extreme hard path. Your insecurity may cause you to doubt yourself. And so you take the easy way, not even approaching your real edge or your real gift. Alternatively, your insecurity may lead you to push, 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 seeking to become victorious over your own sense of lack. Both approaches avoid your actual condition in the moment, which is often fear. If you are stressfully avoiding your fear, you cannot relax into the fearless. Your fear is the sharpest definition of yourself. You should know it. You should feel it virtually, constantly. Fear needs to become your friend so that you are no longer uncomfortable with it. Rather, primary fear shows you that you are at your edge. Staying with the fear, staying at your edge allows real transformation to occur. Neither lazy nor aggressive, playing your edge allows you to perceive the moment with the least amount of distortion. You are willing to be with what is rather than trying to escape it by pulling back from it or trying to escape it by pushing beyond it into some future goal. Fear of fear may lead you to hang back, living a lesser life than you are capable. Fear of fear may lead you to push ahead, living a, a false life off center, tense and missing the moment. But the capacity to feel this moment, including your fear, without trying to escape it, creates a state of alive and humbly, and humble spon. Sp sp how do you say this? Spontaneity or spontaneous? Spon spontaneity. That's what it is. Spontaneity. So I'm gonna re restart that sentence. <clears throat> but the capacity to feel this moment, including your fear without trying to escape it creates a state of alive and humble spontaneity. You are ready for the unknown as it unfolds, since you are not pulled back or pushed forward from the horizon of the moment. You are hanging right over the edge. By leaning just beyond your fear, you challenge your limits compassionately without trying to escape the feeling of your fear itself. You step beyond the solid ground of security with an open heart. You stand in the space of unknowingness, raw and awake. Here, the gravity of deep being will attend you to the only place where fear is obsolete, the eternal free fall of home, where you always are. Own your fear and lean just beyond it in every aspect of your life, starting now. So basically challenge yourself. All right. Challenge yourself to the point where you can sit back and say, I'm proud of myself. Like conquering your fears instead of being scared of them. Instead of being scared of them and also versus like pressing so hard into the opposite direction that you're not consciously thinking about it. Right. Like you're not in your being because you're like, go, 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 running yourself dry to the point where you're not like, it, it's not healthy because you're not being in your purpose. But, if you're living at your edge, you're still pursuing towards that goal, consciously being able to study more, be disciplined more, do things more because you're living at your edge and you know and you know that you're choosing more challenging, living at your edge type of activities versus settling into your comfort zone, which is maybe for me, maybe watching YouTube or basketball games or Netflix with Maddie or something like that. And instead of doing that, I'm replacing that with living at my edge and saying like I'm going to focus on what I have to do to improve my future right now whether it's 
it be developing a certain aspect of my of a skill of a craft or whatever I have to do. Um, being consistent in whatever work I have to do, and for you, same thing. Whether it be coding, um, whether it be just generally developing your knowledge of different financial opportunities that you can have. Like, oh, what are tax loopholes? You know, what are things that they should have taught us in school that I should probably know as a as a 27, about to be 28 year old man in this life? You know, what are what are some pitfalls of this life that I need to be aware of? Challenging yourself, learning more, living at your edge. That's what I gained from that anyways. How you feeling? I'm feeling great. Feeling great? Great. You want me to continue? Yes. Okay. Chapter nine. Do it for love. The way a man penetrates the world should be the same way he penetrates his woman. His woman. Sorry. Women. His women. <laughs> his woman. Not merely for personal gain or pleasure, but to magnify love openness and depth so that's how you should penetrate the world the way you penetrate your woman to magnify love openness and depth the next time you embrace your woman sexually feel your ultimate desire your deepest desire in life feel why you are doing anything at all in life and specifically why you are uniting with your lover there may be many lessons sorry there may be many lesser reasons, but what is your deepest ultimate reason? Most men's ultimate reason for doing anything has to do with his discovering their deepest truth, enjoying total freedom and love and giving their fullest gift. Yet many men settle for enjoying a little bit of freedom and love while incompletely giving their gifts. They enjoy the freedom to buy a nice car, to have loving sex fairly often, and to sleep late on Sunday, but they generously donate their spare cash to a good cause, lovingly buy their woman a diamond ring and happily coach a little league team. These are enjoyable freedoms and real gifts that make a significant difference in people's lives, but for many men, it is still not enough. The freedom or love they have achieved and the way they have given their gifts often have a sense of incompleteness. Something is still lacking. There is still a desire to go beyond, to untrap themselves, to, to enjoy life free of subtle sense of constraint, loneliness, underlying tension, and fear. <laughs> and for many men, try as they might, the sense remains that their full, sorry, their fullest gift remains ungiven. Their life feels somewhat false at its core, as does their ex as fuck. I can't. <laughs> My speech. Sorry about that. And for many men, try as they might, the sense remains that their fullest gift remains ungiven. Their life feels somewhat false at its core, as the, as does their sexing. <laughs> When a man gives his true gift of sex to his woman, he penetrates and blooms her beyond all limits to, into love. It is the same with the world. To bloom woman and world for real takes authenticity, persistence, and courage of heart. Okay. So... When you think about uh, like an intimate relationship that you have with your significant other and then my significant other, right? I, you know, my relationship and my significant other, I should say. That's pretty much like whenever we're operating at our highest point with them in our relationship, that's pretty much from the, the same place that we should come from whenever it is giving our gift to the world. From that same, like we want to really please the world. Like we really want to give our fullest gift to the world out of, out of everything. And it's not for like any kind of sick gain, but it's to actually like to make the world feel good. Right. You know, like you're trying to make the world feel good, not because you're trying to take advantage of the world, but because you're operating from a place of like giving a gift to the world. 
So if it's like, like say you say you want to code, why do you want to code? Do you feel like you can give the, the world a gift through coding? Whether it be yeah. like developing an actual useful, more seamless thing, you know? What is your end goal? What is your purpose? Same thing for me. What is my purpose? What is my message? What am I trying to do? What am I trying to give back? Who needs to hear these mentorships and, you know, maybe have some kind of direction? Whether it be you, whether it be my little brother, whether it be myself, whether it be my significant other and her being able to understand me better because I understand myself better. All right. All right. Now I'm trying to go too deep into my own thing right now. Um, huh? So you're good, bro. <laughs> um, when a man gives his true gift of sex to his woman, he penetrates and blooms her beyond all limits into love. It is the same with the world. To bloom woman and world for real takes authenticity, persistence, and courage of heart. A man must know the truth at his core and be willing to give his give his gifts fully. No holding back. He must be willing to dedicate his sex and his life to magnifying love by penetrating woman and world with his true gifts. This willingness is rare. Many men are willing to poke their women and bloom her in a mediocre way sharing a few orgasms and a few emotional moments of bonding before going over tomorrow's schedule many men are willing to poke the world and bloom it in a mediocre way making a few bucks and contributing enough betterment so they don't feel like their life is a total waste but very few men are willing to do the deed for real to use everything they've got to liberate their woman and the world into the deepest possible truth and love and openness. Few men are willing to give their deepest genius, their true endowment, the poetry of their being, with every thrust of sex and life. Most men are limpened with doubts and uncertainties where they hold back their true drive because of fear. So they diddle diddle their woman and the world just enough to extract the pleasure and comfort they need to a, a sewage a s s u a g e a sewage a s s u a g e i don't know in the room before me neither and they need to and comfort they need to assuage their nagging sense of false falsity and incompleteness But if you are willing to discover and embrace your truth, lean through your fears and give everything you've got. You can penetrate the world and your woman from the core of your being and bloom them into the love without limit. You can ravish your woman so deeply that her surrender breaks your heart into light. You can press yourself into the world with such enduring love that the world opens and receives your deepest gifts. There is no essential difference between entering your woman's feminine heart and entering fully into the world. Both forms of intercourse, sexual and worldly, require sensitivity, spon spontaneity, and a strong connection to deep truth in order to penetrate chaos and closure in a way that love prevails. Neither woman nor world are, are predictable. They will often seem to resist your gifts and test your capacity to persist. And just as surely, they will tenderly, tenderly respond to the authenticity of your relaxed ministrations, the freedom expressed in your humor, and the invasion of your adamant love. They will open in love and receive you fully, only to resist and test you again, moments or days later. Neither woman nor world can be second-guessed or fooled. They know when you are just dicking around, they want to receive you for real. There are two ways to deal with women and the world without compromising your true gifts or dribbling away the force of your deep being. 
One way is to renounce sexual intimacy and worldliness, totally dis dedicating yourself without distraction or compromise to the path you choose to pursue, free from the seemingly constant demands of woman and world. The other way is to fuck both to smithereens, to ravish them with your love, unsheathed, to give your true gifts despite the constant tussle of the woman and the world, to smelt your authenticity authentic gifts into this friction of opposite sorry of opposition and surrender to thrust love from freedom of your deep being even as your body and mind die blissfully through the crucif crucifixion of inevitable pleasure and pain attraction and repulsion gain and loss no gifts left ungiven no limit to the depth of being only openness freedom and love as the legacy of your intercourse with woman and world. What's the big plug? If you are going to trist, T R Y S T, trist. If you are going to trist with women in the world at all, better to go all the way and ravish them from the depths of your true core, blooming them open with the wide gifts of your unrelenting heart. Otherwise, if you sheepishly, sheepishly penetrate them to gratify your own needs, your woman and the world will feel your lack of dedication, depth, and truth. Bra Ooh, that's good. That was if you're, I gotta read that one more time. If you are going to trist with woman and world at all, better go all the way and ravish them from the depths of your true core, blooming them open with the wide gifts of your unrelenting heart. Otherwise, if you sheepishly penetrate them to gratify your own needs, your woman and the world will feel your lack of dedication, depth, and truth. Rather than yielding in love to your loving, they will distract you, suck your energy, and draw you into endless complications so that your life and relationship become an almost constant search for release of constraint from constraint. You can be a, ooh, that's a hard word, renunciate. You can be a renunciate and live alone apart from women and world. But if you choose a life of sexual and worldly intercourse, you will feel trapped by women and world unless you are free in the midst of the true fuck yielding. <laughs> in the midst of true fuck, yielding yourself into the giving, holding nothing back, dissolving all time in the open of love through thick and thin this is the way of the superior man Sheesh. Hmm. Hmm. hey slavery got fucked one you got fucked the other me and trey were talking the other day and he said that he had a pastor come up to him whenever he was a kid and say whatever you're going to be in life be a damn good one <laughs> He said, if you're going to be a, a pimp, be a damn good one. <laughs> if you're going to be a whatever, be a damn good one. Like, basically, don't do just anything and do it. Do it half ass. Like, do whatever you're going to do and be damn good at it. That's kind of like the same principle as, as that. Like, if you're going to f finagle in th the world of your woman and the world, do it from your true core. Right. Not halfway. Yeah, but don't half ass it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay. Let's finish chapter 10. Well, we could say we finished the first 10 chapters. All right. Yeah. Chapter 10. Enjoy your friend's criticism. A man's capacity to receive another man's direct criticism is a measure of his capacity to receive masculine energy. If he doesn't have a good relationship to masculine energy, e.g. his father, then he will act like a woman and be hurt or defensive rather than make use of other men's criticism. Okay, so that kind of explains we both did not have that relationship with our father. Basically, that means that we're probably able to take on masculine, yeah, and receive masculine criticism or masculine energy. Okay. Huh? I was saying it would be easier than other men who have always like 
had a really strong masculine father who's just on their ass all the time, criticizing them about everything, and they're sick of it. Yeah, you start to reject masculine energy at that point. Yeah. Okay. About once a week, you should sit down with your closest men friends and discuss what you are doing in your life and what you are afraid of doing. The conversation should be short and simple. You should state where you are at. Then your friends should give you a behavioral experiment, something you can do that will reveal something to you or grant more freedom in your life. I want to have an affair with Denise, but I don't want to hurt my wife. I'm afraid of her finding out, you might say. You've been talking about Denise now for six months. You are wasting your life and energy on this fantasy. You should either have sex with her by tomorrow night or drop the whole thing and never talk about it again. Your friends might say, challenging your hesitation and mediocrity. Okay, I know I'm not going to do it. I see now that I am too afraid of, running, of ruining my marriage to have an affair with Denise. My marriage is more important than my desire for Denise. I'll drop it and refocus my priorities in my life. Thanks. That's some good shit. Your close men friends should be willing to challenge your medio mediocrity by suggesting a concentrate action you can perform that will pop you out of your rut one way or the other. And you must be willing to offer them your brutal honesty in the same way. If you are all to grow, good friends should not tolerate mediocrity in one another. If you are at the edge or if you are at your edge, your men friends should respect that but not let you off the hook. They should honor your fears and in love continue to goad you beyond them without pushing you. If you merely want support from if you merely want support from your men friends without challenge, it bes bespeaks an unresolved issue you may have with your father, whether he is alive or dead. The father force is the force of loving challenge and guidance. Without this masculine force in your life, your direction becomes unchecked and you are liable to meander in the mush of your own ambiguity and indecision. Your close men friends can provide the stark light of love, uncompromised by a fearful Mr. Nice Guy act, by which you can see the direction you really want to go. Choose men friends who themselves are living at the edge, facing their fears and living just beyond them. Men of this kind can love you without protecting you from the necessary confrontation with the reality that your life involves. You should be able to trust that these friends will tell you about your life as they see it, offer you a specific action which will shed light on your own position and give you the support necessary to live in the freedom just beyond your edge which is not always or even usually comfortable. First ch 10 chapters of the way of superior man completed. Oh, I like it. Yeah. Any takeaways that, before we wrap? Yeah, that was just like I didn't really write down like things that I want to remember from the book you had a balance you know you 50-50 balance between feminine and masculine between the two poles the man and the woman missions or freedoms is the priority of the masculine so the man the masculine wants to be free or have purpose it's like things that I, I personally like want to remember the man's way, you know, one hour a day doing what I want to do. Yeah. I think make me happy. It makes me feel like I, those are the things that I want to feel purpose in. And if I'm not feeling happy in those things that I want to feel purpose in, just find something else, you know? Yeah. And uh, the feminine will always seem chaotic for the masculine. That won't really. That one really stuck with me. Yeah, that one made sense. Yeah, it makes complete sense. So that's why women are so complicated for some reason. And 
like, I still, I'm probably never gonna understand why. Probably it's like, I, maybe it's just, I don't know, maybe it's any even feminine dudes will seem complicated to me if they're more feminine. Like, I know a couple of guys who I feel like are more feminine, not really gay or anything. It's like give off more feminine energy. Don't really get up, give off that alpha male energy that you know we talk about. And then they're complicated. I don't understand them. Right. What else I wrote? Uh, don't waste. Um, don't waste. Uh, don't wait on anything. So a moment waited is a moment wasted. So I don't. I, I personally, I hate wasting time. I don't like wasting time. If I feel like I'm wasting time, that I and I feel like I should be doing something that isn't a waste of my time, then maybe I should just stop what I'm doing, whatever I'm doing, whoever I'm doing it with, and do something that's more worth my time. Right. So, you know, so uh, practice opening and time to close, like we were talking about earlier, like sometimes, like, uh, I'll read my threshold, but maybe I should be able to try to extend that threshold even longer just to remain open, make sure I keep my front open. And then operate from a, a place of giving to the world. I never thought of, I never really thought of that in a way, like, just like, trying to do better not just for myself not just for my family but for those around me and those on this earth maybe create something you know what I'm coding create something that will benefit not just myself but benefit other people to connect with other people whatever whatever it can be you know conquer your fears man conquer your fears and if you can't can't conquer your fears you're never gonna grow up. Right. So that's kind of what I mostly got from. And you conquer your fears by living at your edge. A little bit beyond. A little bit beyond your edge. You're like, you're stretch. You're you're pushing those fears, and then by and then eventually it's kind of like stepping into the cold tub. You're like putting your whole feet into there, into the cold tub, and then because and that's your edge, then slowly but surely you can get your whole body in there. Yep. So we first you'll start with just your ankles, then you'll go up to your knees, then your lower half of your body, then you'll maybe go up to your stomach, then to your chest. Then by the time you know it, you're neck deep and walking from the stairs to the pool, whenever it's a cold day, slowly walking down a little ramp. Okay, you're like, okay, I'm getting more, a little bit more comfortable. Walks a little further in. Yeah. But if you're living in your comfort zone, you're not getting in the water at all. You're just standing above outside of the water. The cold for me is something good. Yeah. Like, you know, like, in the cold water, you come like, hot your beer stand go. Yeah. But, I mean, some people may operate from a place of like, I'm going to just jump in the pool. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's how I got to do it. I'm like, I'm just jumping in. And if I go in too slowly, then I'm just, I don't, I don't want to be slowly getting cold for a long period of time. I'll be cold at once, I'll work at once. Right. That's kind of the only thing I thought about with that concept was like full I've also heard that like full and total immersion is like one of the key things of changing a particular habit about yourself. It's like creating so much momentum in the opposite direction of a certain habit. Get out almost. Huh? It's like canceling it out almost. Right, right, right. And then you start to create that opposite direction of that momentum. You know, it's so operate from a place of comfort. They're like, oh, well, I'm comfortable up here, so I'm not getting in there. So, yeah, yeah. I'd rather not deal with it. They're never going to grow. Those people never grow. And they may be cool for right now, but eventually those people always end up becoming miserable. Yep, exactly. Because they, because they have a lot of like, they blame a lot of things on other people. Mm -hmm. Where they expect other people to do things for them, where they should let that do for themselves. Right, 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 right. They have a lot of resentment for a lot of different things, a lot of different people, a lot of different situations, whether it be high school, some that they, you know, even if at that, they'll reach a point where it's like, okay, bro, high school was 20 years ago. <laughs> All right, I understand that you had to experience that while you were a child, but guess what? You're not a child anymore, and that can no longer serve as an, as an excuse for you. 
you never get over your past. If you never figure, try to even make an effort to figure out how to get over your past, you can't live towards your future. Just like you said, living in that moment, doing things with meaning in the moment. If you're not doing things with meaning in the moment, why are you here, bro? You're just taking up space. You're just existing for nothing. Exactly.